date is March 2nd, 2020. This interview is being filmed at the West Volusia Historical Society's Conrad Center. The subject of the interview is Dr. T. Wayne Bailey, who is Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Stetson University. My name is Betty Brady. I'll be talking with Dr. Bailey. Um, Dr. Bailey taught at Stetson University for 53 years, from 1963 to 2016. I believe you said you hold a record? I think I hold the record. You hold the record. <clears throat> he grew up north of Pensacola, entered the University of Florida at 15 in political science, and earned later a master's degree in teaching at Peabody College in Nashville, which is now part of Vanderbilt University. He taught for a few years and then returned to the University of Florida for a doctorate, again in political science. And I just wondered about your interest in political science. I thought you might want to talk a little bit about your family, too. I'm glad you asked me to do that. Actually, some people ask me, what's the T. Wayne? Well, it's Terrell, T-E-R-R-E-L-L, -L, Wayne Bailey. I was born in a rural area. I worked on a farm through my childhood. My father was a politico. Ah. My first memory, politically, is working for the election of Senator Claude Pepper in 1940. Wow. Uh, that's pretty early in my mm -hmm. childhood, carrying literature around for him. And then working throughout with candidates and issues. It gets in your bloodstream, and there is no antidote. So throughout my life, I have worked externally in the community, and I guess my legacy primarily is not in research, but is in the community activities and hopefully leaving some footprints for the future. My father and mother were from the Panhandle. My father originally from Alabama. His name, interestingly, was Theodore Roosevelt uh -oh. Bailey, another political issue. My mother was um, very bright, but only went to the eighth grade. She was my go-to person. Uh, and if you don't have that, you really don't go anywhere. They worked very hard for me. And when I got the invitation to enter the University of Florida at age 15, uh, the reason being that my high school ran out of things for me to take, <laughs> and they wanted me to, to move on. Actually, I moved up several grades and irritated some of my classmates because the uh, woman, the person who was to be valedictorian, I suddenly became the valedictorian. And I didn't mean to do that, but it worked out just fine. By the way, the class was only about 20, maybe 25 uh, seniors. I was actually the second person in my county, Santa Rosa, to earn a PhD. Mm. The first person was my cousin, Rayford Saucer, who preceded me at the University of Florida, became a psychologist with NASA and the Mercury Astronauts Program. I then when I finished at University of Florida, I was uh, very strongly a member of the Baptist Student Union, First Baptist Church there. My pastor, Fred Lawn, wrote to President Edmonds and said, I have a young man I want to recommend to you. This is President Ollie Edmonds of Stetson University. President Ollie Edmonds, okay. one of the presidents, six presidents and, uh, that I've served under. And, at Stetson, and President Edmonds turned the letter over to Dean Hugh McInerney. And at that time, 
uh, Dr. Gilbert Lycan, chairman of the history department, was going on leave with the Fulbright to the Philippines. So they invited me to Delan for an interview. The first night I stayed with uh, Betty and Evans Johnson at their home. And the primary actor at that time was a cat by the name of Jackie, uh, named after Jackie Kennedy, <laughs> although she said later on Jackie turned out to be Jack Kennedy. Mm. We uh, toured the area. Uh, the, uh, and this was in 1963. In 1963, okay. they hired me for one year, and I thought I was going on to a research university. That was what my major professor wanted to happen. But something happened, I guess. Uh, the roots uh, went a little bit deeper. Uh, Dr. Larkin came back. Dr. McInery called me in and said, uh, Wayne, I think we really need a political science department here. There wasn't one. There wasn't one. <laughs> okay. Uh, there was a political science major, but the history courses were listed as uh, dual uh, listings. Mm -hmm. And I, I really had not thought about that because I came here as a history professor. Oh, by the way, I taught Western Civilization at 7.40 a.m., Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Did you have any students? I, I had, they forced them in. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I think I maybe had two classes of that. Mm -hmm. And then I think two other classes. I liked that because in my previous teaching at Chipola Junior College in Mariana from 1955 to 1959, I often taught five classes. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, outside of my major area, I was, for example, the speech and debate teacher. I was a speech teacher for four years. Uh, and then, uh, I guess I did okay. I was uh, sort of uh, uh, wet behind the ears. And so they hired me on to do that. And at that time, there was an economics department and Dr. McInery felt that that was a weak department. So he said, I'm going to put you in with the economics department as a, a, a kind of joint, um, where, where you'd have joint facilities and a joint secretary. And that's the way the political science department developed. We can talk a little bit more about that, but I uh, was able with Dr. Gary Marius, who had just finished his doctorate at Duke University. Uh, he came in with me, but he had an ROTC scholarship and an obligation to spend two years in the U.S. Army. So I think he taught one year with me, then went away to what was then, I guess, the developing Vietnam War. Uh, he came back subsequently, I think in 1966, 67. But it, in the meantime, the department grew to over 100 majors. Wow, that was quick. With two professors. I taught the American government oftentimes with 60 or 70 students in what then was called 5L, uh, the, in the now DuPont Ball Library, where they had a classroom. And we taught, yeah, four classes. The basement of the library, if I remember. Most of, <laughs> yes, uh, because that was the largest uh, area for teaching at that time. We did not have the Johnny John's room on the third floor of Elizabeth Hall, which is presently a larger lecture classroom. How many students were there at the time? And the number of students were probably smaller. We had just gone through the post-war mm -hmm. period where you had many, many veterans under the VA, probably uh, less than 2,000, well okay. less than 2,000. And uh, I was uh, amazed at the number of students who did come. 
uh, we um, were able to handle with two persons, Dr. Maris and myself, for most of 10 years, oh, well over 100 students, sometimes 150. And one can talk about that a, a little bit because in that period that where he did return, the 1966-67-68 period, we produced over 15 uh, students who went on for PhDs in political science and who became, many of whom who became deans and provosts. I will mention just one or two, Dr. Uh, Edwards uh, pre became the professor of political science at uh, Texas A&M and became uh, the author of the most produced college textbook in American government. Uh, Dr. Edwards is still so well known, he's quoted in the New York Times and appears on PBS and uh, uh, other kinds of uh, uh, other kinds of facilities. I'd mention also Dr. Bill Mishler, who became head of the uh, National Science Foundation social science area for about five years in Washington D.C. Now, Professor Emeritus at uh, Arizona State University, and Dr. Natalie Davis, uh, Professor Emeritus of Political Science from Birmingham Southern, who collaborated with me on several projects too. But we can talk more about that as we go. So you have your students scattered all over the country. <laughs> all over the country, and oh. I, I'll tell you about one Remember, we were, we were talking on March 2nd, 2020. Well, last week, a gentleman came to uh, my driveway, uh, came up, knocked on the door, and said those awful words. I, Dr. Bailey, I bet you don't remember me. And I said, Barry Spivey? <laughs> Where have you been? And he said, you mean you remember me? I said, of course I do. And then we began to talk about his work at Stetson and his mother who often uh, had the only transport she had was a bicycle with her basket uh, around the land. He said, yes, yes, yes. He said, I have received my doctor's degree from Mason, George Mason University finally in uh, educational leadership. He started out in his political science at UNC. He said, I've been a provost for most of my career, but I remember most of all the international relations class you had in 1968 when he graduated. Then he quoted the authors we used, Morgenthau and Kennan, and he said, you know, you often talked about George Kennan, I was able in Washington to see him, and I'm giving you a book of essays on him and by him uh, for you to read. Now, you used to take your students to Washington and New York. How did that work? Well, let's talk about that. Again, we're talking about the period uh, of uh, Dr. Hugh McInerney to begin with. Dr. McInerney, in uh, 19, I think it was 68 or 69, uh, contacted the faculty and said, have I got a deal for you? What I'm proposing is that we take the two semesters, keep them, uh, maybe move the dates a little bit to make room for a four and a half week winter term. A winter term. January and I think the first week in February, actually. And in every four years now, you'll have that 
semester or winter term off. Ooh, that is a deal for faculty members. That's a deal for faculty members. Now, I don't know that we're going to increase your pay for that, uh, and you're going to have extra papers to grade probably, but look, you can do all these, all these experimental fun things. Uh, and we're going to require students, to, I think, to take three or four of them, meaning uh, they'd have one winter term off two. And it's uh, not going to be uh, a curricular matter. You don't have to take your courses to the curriculum committee. You can do uh, creatively whatever you think would excite students. So what did you do? So I says to myself, why don't we think about taking some students to New York, to the United Nations for a week, and maybe uh, 10 days even, and spend two or three weeks in Washington all about the government. At the time, the Congress member was uh, Bill Chappell, mm -hmm. uh, and he said to me, Wayne, you can use my office as a base for planning and coordinating the program. Wow, that's a great benefit. It's a big break. And then we had a student who was very interested in this, who helped with the Washington part. And I was able to make some contacts uh, through the uh, through the. USA, UN, the United Nations Association of the United States, they helped me get started with the UN. And remember, this is December now. Yeah, you're taking Floridians up north. Up to New York. Did they wear sandals? They, uh, <laughs> and by the way, on the first, the first time I did this uh, in New York, I forgot to take my overcoat. <laughs> so my wife, Frances, had to go to the Greyhound station and she put my overcoat in and we had to find a way to get to the uh, transit station in, uh, in Manhattan to get my overcoat. Uh, it was just a, you know, it was a Floridian. It was nice yeah. and mild when we left, but it was, bone chilling when we got there. Did you all fly up there? We all flew up okay. there and we had, you can imagine, uh, I cannot believe we were able to do all this because it took so much uh, coordination. Mm -hmm. But we were all able to meet in New York. We stayed initially in those first years at the Tudor, T-U-D-O-R, hotel, which is on 42nd Street was later converted to condos. And then later we, uh, in our seminar state at the Grand Central YMCA, which was quite satisfactory. So you visited the UN, you saw committees we, uh, working, what did you did do? We did everything there at the UN. We had access, remember again in December, UN officials kept on, they didn't really have a holiday. Christmas was not a holiday for them. We had uh, access to staff at the highest level. The uh, gentleman who wrote most of the language of the Law of the Seas Convention, Law of the Sea, LOS Convention, which is very important today, was able to talk about how he did that and how he got various terminology and the name uh, for uh, different parts of it. Uh, and, th and then we talked and had films, uh, especially in the African area, with some of the diplomats. We went to the Soviet uh, mission more, uh, several years now. This is over uh, actually more than a 10-year period from the uh, 1970, 69, 70 to 1982 to the Soviet mission. Hmm. Uh, we went to the U.S. mission always right across, which is right across from the U.N. building to the British mission 
Interesting. Uh, to several other missions, and and actually we're talking not to subordinate employees, but to uh, uh, the, the ambassador themselves. Wonderful. Then in Washington, you you were based in in Congressman Chapel's office. Yeah. And and let, let me say one more okay. thing about New York. The um, interesting thing there was a, the, the Methodist Church, maybe still does, has a, a special interest in the UN. And they had uh, personnel that uh, were very helpful to our students because students were taking notes and had to do a paper on each of the two areas, that is New York and Washington. And in Washington, yes, we um, again were talking about a rather lengthy period from all, all through the 70s till uh, we the university decided to abolish the winter term in 1982. Uh, uh, and by the way, we were able to keep a part of it later using the uh, holiday period in December and January mm -hmm. where the university had maybe several weeks. I think we went two or three times, uh, but that uh, did not provide. It was better when you had it as a, when we had, as a winter term. Again, we officially. initially it was a time where we could spend uh, three weeks in Washington. Mm -hmm. We stayed, uh, that was an interesting part, we stayed at first at a boarding house that was uh, on Massachusetts Avenue, walking distance to the Capitol. We wound up staying at a hotel that's still in business the Harrington Hotel, which is about three blocks from the White House Treasury Department area. And there, again, the richness of the seminars uh, still is overflowing. I have students at, on an average of once a week talking to me about what the Washington uh, experience uh, did for them. Uh, we had most of the time, over 30 students who enrolled. Uh, they earned six semester hours of credits. That's heavy. And we uh, tried ABC grading and pass no credit grading. And it worked seemingly fairly well both ways uh, because it was experiential uh, learning. And in the Meantime, uh, most of the students who were in that program developed some kind of uh, contact uh, network, and more than maybe I'd say a third of them managed to use that contact network in their schooling or in their professional mm -hmm. uh, work uh, with it. I think that explains why, partially, why so many of your students went on to do government service. They were exposed very well to it. In the Washington, D.C. Alumni Association are a large number of... of uh, you have your own alumni association. We, we do. And I don't know if we pivot here and say another part of Washington, it was known as the Washington Semester. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I came here, Dr. Lichen was the faculty representative, and he, uh, after a year or two or three, said, I want you to do that. We had uh, a quota of two students a year in the fall semester that we could send. It was very difficult because there was no financial aid, and only more wealthy families could afford that experience. I began working with Dean David Brown, who was the uh, dean of the program, and I said to him, and, and was able to persuade the administration to allow Stetson financial aid to count toward that program including Stetson dollars. When I approached Dean Brown, I said, since Stetson is allowing its dollars to count, can't American University help us 
So this was through American University? This is Washington. Uh, the Washington semester okay. that is part of American University. Working with him, we gradually were able to increase the American University scholarships. Uh, at first it was $1,000, then it was 2000 then it was 3000 <laughs> then it was 4000 wow. So that by the time we had AU scholarships and Stetson financial aid, any student could go to the Washington semester, which made me very, very delighted. Of course. We also had a situation where when we had two or three faculty children, sons or daughters, they wanted to go. And since, you know, faculty dependents don't pay tuition, uh, there wasn't any financial aid to go mm -hmm. with them. I think I can use her name. Dr. Hallam's daughter. Mm, Ann Hallam. Dr. Ann Hallam wanted to go. So I called Dr. Brown and I said, you know, how can we do this? He said, well, let me think about it. So he wrote out a $9,000 tuition scholarship wow. for Dr. Hallam's daughter. Sounds like he appreciated your students coming. They did. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I'm bragging, one of my students, Darlene Walker, the, we required a writing project, a thesis. Uh, when she attended, I think it was 1969, 70, she won the award as having the most outstanding paper of all of the, I think they had around 30, 40, 50 colleges that semester. Wow. So that they did pride sets in students. Very impressive. Let's backtrack a little bit and talk more generally about Stetson. You were there in some pivotal times, one being when Stetson integrated. What do you remember about that? When I came to Delan in 1963, uh, Delan was segregated. The land was segregated. De Delan was segregated. Mm -hmm. We had the bus station which is now Stetson property. And in the uh, center area, you had the ticket agent with two windows. There were two waiting rooms. One window was the white waiting room. And the other, and it was they were very nice about it. They called it the colored waiting room. When I went downtown to Penny's, which is on the corner would now the Woodland uh, Boulevard in New York, that multi-story building that I think has Morgan and Morgan all plastered over it. Uh, we went and shopped there, went to the second floor, and they had an elevator, which is still there. And we went out and wanted to get a drink of water, and we noticed there were two fountains. Now, this is 1963. One was white. And the other was labeled colored. That same year, I had an African-American friend, I believe he was from Florida A&M, who came to visit. And I said, let's go downtown and have a sandwich. We went to the restaurant, which is in that same building in the basement. It was called the Calico Kitchen at that time. We went down stairs into the restaurant and the waitress intercepted us and said, we don't serve blacks here. So we, till between our legs, I guess you'd say, left uh, without eating. And we couldn't go to the what they call the truck stop, which is out on 15A now, famous, uh, very segregated. 
And that's, uh, that's the attitude. And, and our schools were segregated. Mm -hmm. We were in I still, think our schools were some of the last to integrate. We were uh, in this called mass resistance, using legal methods to keep schools segregated, using residential uh, formulas, et cetera. And, and we, we were just getting into Brown versus the Board of Education in 63, I guess. So here is Stetson, Dr. Hugh McInerney again, a pioneer. He um, pushed against all of the segregation practices involving the Southern Baptist Convention, the Florida Baptist Convention. Oh, by the way, Martin Luther King had said a little later that the most segregated hour in America was on Sunday morning at mm -hmm. 11 a.m. You, you remember that quote. Well, Dr. McInerney worked with John Pelham and we brought a black student from Palatka. Pelham was from the Baptist Convention? He was actually First Baptist Church, I think, of Palatka. Of Palatka, okay. Yeah, and... And you brought a student Neil from Palatka. Hunter, Neil Hunter. Mm -hmm. He happened to become my uh, advisee. Uh, was it easy for Neil? It, it wasn't. But he, he did... He did okay. He graduated. Unfortunately, he died of natural causes not long after he finished here. Mm -hmm. And we had a student in the music school, a beautiful uh, African-American soprano, I think. Uh, Dr. McInerney was a member of the First Baptist Church here in Deland with me. And we worked and we... Uh, we said she should be in the choir. And the church was quite resistive, but did let her perform. During Dr. McInerney's time, I uh, became chairman of the deacons of the First Baptist Church. And the deacons decided that we should integrate the First Baptist Church of Delan or offer that. The church resisted. And there was a vote. I've forgotten the exact vote, but it was, a lot of people didn't vote, but I think it was 71 to integrate and 65 not to integrate. So you can guess how many African Americans came in yeah, that climate. Yeah, that wouldn't be very welcoming. Not very welcoming. So it was a, a difficult time. I, I never did march. Some of the faculty marched with the students and faculty from Dillon. I think it was junior high, actually, which was located in the center part of town mm -hmm. against uh, segregation. And the uh, news journal, the Daytona Beach News Journal, uh, the Davidson family need to be mentioned, Tippin Davidson and uh, Herbert Davidson, the father, they crusaded for integration. integration before it actually happened. And Dan Warren, uh, who had been a state attorney, uh, became involved, especially in St. Augustine, but a good friend of Stetson of mine, in pushing the integration. It was not easy. And Claude Kirk, later, uh, resisted integration. Our faculty member, Ed Smotherman, in education, was a school board member, and Kirk threatened to uh, suspend or remove the school board from office if they complied. Wow. 
we think of it so easily today, mm -hmm. but I think our students need to realize that we were, Stetson was on the front end of uh, racial integration and that uh, what we would call today diversity, we didn't use that word then. Uh, to us, diversity was just having blacks. May I confess something else to you? When I came to Stetson and met Dr. McInery, he handed me a form, which was a uh, Christian, uh, a Christian subscription. And as a faculty member, I needed to sign. Oh, really? That I subscribe to Christian principles. And Dr. Uh, Edmund's view was we were Christian, broadly Christian, but not narrowly sectarian. Mm -hmm. uh, if I couldn't subscribe to that, I couldn't have been hired. I didn't know that. We had no Jewish faculty members. And it was difficult to bring a Catholic faculty member on to teach Spanish. So I don't want to seem like Stetson was shining armor. We had much to grow on. Mm -hmm. grow on. And I think if you look at Stetson's uh, university bulletin over the years, the, um, the mission statement until very late proclaimed that the university was Christian and its motto, Pro Deo. At Veritate. Mm -hmm. But the Pro Deo. Yeah. Yeah. And I happen to be here, and I guess fortunately, in that classical period where I saw some of the transitions. Mm -hmm. Stetson could not permit dancing, for example. And students were required to go to chapel. And the big revolution was going only once a week instead of twice a week. And that was true when you came here in 1963? Yeah. Oh, yes, of course it was, okay. yes. And I was told, Wayne, back in Dr. Forbes' time, the faculty sat on the stage every time at chapel as a requirement, oh. as an expectation. Yeah. And one of the... Um, we came here 10 years later, and that, those things had changed. I just want to so say, so... you were in that transition. So I was in that transition. Mm -hmm. This was the period of Dean Etter Turner, mm -hmm. an iconic figure of Stetson Dean history. of women. Yes. Dean of women. Well, actually, Dean of Students, was I she? think, yes. Okay. I thought she was Dean of Women. And I think finally they did hire uh, a Dean, uh, Dean George Hood, who became Dean of Students. But I think you did have a Dean of Women and you had a Dean of Men. But she was the oversight. She, uh, she was the go-to person in university student life, university social life. And the students, uh, the women, were, uh, had to sign in and sign out. Uh, they could only be, there was a curfew, mm -hmm. I think, 10 o'clock or some, sometime. Mm -hmm. And on the weekend, they would make it a little bit later. And no co-ed dorms. And certainly <laughs> the idea of co-ed dorms would be um, all altogether unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And I do remember I was on the Student Affairs Committee very early. I guess I learned that young faculty get those opportunities. Senior faculty like to give them opportunities. They share. Mm -hmm. And the big issue, and I met in Dr. Edmund's office about it, one of the male students in his window had placed a beer bottle. And the issue was whether or not that student was to be expelled. Wow. Wow. And this was the classical period. It, it really was. And... It, in some ways, was the uh, best of times and maybe the worst of times. Revenues were very limited, very limited. Dr. Lycan, again, my mentor here, Dr. Gilbert Lycan, we often sat down 
uh, on the bench at the Holler Fountain and talked. Uh, maybe, maybe once a week, once every two weeks, just to talk. A great man. I, he said, Wayne, you know, when I needed a library book, I had to buy it myself and put it on the shelf. Wow. Betty, Gray, uh, Betty Johnson says that's exactly what happened. And, and Evans, her husband, Betty Johnson's husband, said, Wayne, you know, we got Stetson Hall. If the termites don't hold hands, it'll collapse. <laughs> and eventually they did take it down. And eventually they took it down. Yeah, we we it had deferred maintenance. Deferred we, maintenance. There wasn't money for that. Yeah. yeah. And either Evans, uh, either Graves Edmondson or Dr. Edmonds himself would drive to Jacksonville on Friday afternoon to pick up the Baptist money. Mm. The Baptists contributed a million dollars a year at the time. And they gave it on a weekly basis? And uh, the, Well, a monthly, monthly basis. Monthly basis. In order to make the payroll mm. go. And, and, uh, and Betty Johnson tells me that Evans told her, Evans and uh, Graves Edmondson, when they were bachelors, were roommates. They would often not cash their checks, she said, so the payroll wouldn't bounce. Ooh. Yeah, things have changed. Uh, things, things have changed. changed. And, now, yet, and yet some of the most uh, notable, notable Representatives of Stetson graduated during that period. Senator That's Max true. Cleland, my, That's true. my friend. Your protege. And protege, <laughs> uh, 1963. Mm -hmm. Washington during the Vietnam semester. War. Mm -hmm. Vietnam War. U.S. Senator, head of the Veterans Administration during the Carter administration. Mm -hmm. uh, so many of these iconic figures were products of this of this time. How did the transition occur? Well, it was cultural. Uh, chapel, required chapel, was, became voluntary and then disappeared. Then disappeared. Mm -hmm. And in the period of um, that transition, uh, the controversy, the adversarial nature of Stetson with the Florida Baptist Convention did surface. Dr. Edmonds knew we needed a science center. And the only way to get it was to get a grant from the federal government. At the time, we were in this period of the race with the Soviet Union and so money for these kind of facilities was available. Science was big. Science was big, really. Uh, and they had uh, science scholarships, et cetera. The Baptists said, you can't do that. Why? Because, uh, because the government was bad. Oh, and, oh, government, except government money, I see. It wasn't that, science, and, it was and the and government that's right. money. It's, uh, Okay. Uh, that was their, their position. And, and also the um, notion was, too, that uh, uh, we didn't know where to put it. So Dr. Edmonds confronted both issues. What well, he said, well, we'll borrow the money. Okay. It's not going to be a loan. <laughs> I'm not going to be a grant. Yeah. So we borrowed the money, and later on, I think it became a grant. Okay. Well, where are we going to put it? Um, at the time, Minnesota Avenue was a thoroughfare. It was, if you wanted to commute from one side of Delan to the other, you drove through the Stetson campus. Right through the campus? Right through the campus. Minnesota Avenue. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Okay. Um, I recall one day Dr. Edmonds was trying to cross the street and somebody, some vehicle almost ran over him. 
this is between Elizabeth Hall, right, uh, the uh, North End, and uh, and Delan Hall. He called up uh, John Johns, I think he was the business manager at the time. Said, "I want a speed bump out here today." So they put a big, a big asphalt pump, <sighs> but that didn't quite do the trick. On Minnesota, yeah. right? So we got the science building. Why don't we build it right across the street? Straddling the street. Straddling the street. And the city didn't say anything. Well, the city did. <laughs> so John Johns, Johnny Johns, was a, a politico. So he worked with the city. He said, "Now you know, the traffic along this street will." will not be compatible with the delicate instruments in the labs of the science building. Oh my gosh. And so Dr. Edmonds was able to have his way and so the science building straddles Minnesota Avenue. And guess what? You don't go east-west nope. on Minnesota anymore, nope. do you? Nope. There is still Pennsylvania, but not Minnesota. That's right. So we didn't we we tried uh, to do. Uh, um, Did was was there generally good relationships with the city at that time? The uh, city and the university. No. No. <laughs> okay. Actually, Dr. Edmonds, uh, at the time, it, it was pretty. It's pretty bad. He threatened to move the university campus to a plot we the university owned on the other side of the St. Johns River. Ah. Into Lake County. Into Lake County. The, the university wow. owned a lot. Was was uh, I think given uh, given a large large plot of land, which I think they eventually sold on the bluff of the uh, the larger elevation. Okay. And uh, yeah, the, the university threatened to. I think it was. I don't think anybody ever believed that. But you know, when you're working uh, that way. But the uh, city of Dillon went through some governmental changes, reforms, to a city manager form, really real city manager form, and brought in a professional city manager. And uh, things improved. He understood. Uh, and understood, mm -hmm. and, and uh, the um, um, uh, result of that was that these issues were resolved, the, um, but still questions with the city with reference to the streets on the perimeter of Stetson remained and still remain an issue. Hmm. So you had, uh, you had that period of time. Doc, Dr. Edmonds' period was a period of great importance. Uh, he uh, paved the way for uh, so many other things that were to change. And uh, the um, fact that I was able to serve uh, on the faculty, I think through five, six presidents, an, a an acting president who, whom we don't uh, talk about very much, um, as we should, uh, we saw those uh, changes. I think the next major shift and, and there were some troubling times with uh, 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 with one of the presidents, uh, Dr. Uh, Guerin, as, mm -hmm. you, as you know, uh, 1967, 69. Um, I, I don't know quite how to um, discuss that except to say that Dr. Guerin was an, uh, never had any academic experience at all. He was a former ambassador, so to Lebanon, I think it was. Uh, he was brought in because of his prominence as an ambassador, and he uh, didn't know how to be a president. For example, he hired a sociology professor based on a famous name of a sociologist. It turned out it was a different person. <laughs> Uh, and he, I think, created, uh, I think, uh, some off-campus centers without 
faculty involvement. Uh, the budget was a, a situation. The bottom line is that by 1969, there was so much angst within the university that the faculty and students began to pressure the trustees to take action. And actually, the only time in my 53 years at Stetson, the faculty met and voted no confidence mm -hmm. in the president. And I'm, I'm not proud of it, but my role was to offer the motion to do that. Oh. Well, you were acting for your colleagues. And, and the other part was uh, he and I were fellow deacons at the First Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it was that bad. Wow. And the faculty voted, I think, except for, I think, some members of the religious studies, what now is the religious, it was then the religion department, uh, not to do it. Um, there were very few who didn't, and the most woeful note I ever received in my time at Stetson was a note from him it was on his stationery, Wayne, how could you? And you and I know the tragic end of this. After he left Stetson, he was on the way to uh, Kentucky for an interview. I think his wife was driving. The car was in a, an accident and he, he was killed. He was killed. Yeah. Although his wife, I think it may be a daughter, survived. Um, and those kind of encounters you don't want to have uh, in your life very often, if ever. When you're someplace 53 years, these things happen. <laughs> You saw a lot. Yeah, and, and again, the uh, abrupt disappearance or firing of Guerin uh, uh, created that period where I think Dr. George Borders, who had been dean of men, was made acting president. And it was a terrible struggle of some staff and other interests to uh, make... Dr. Borders, the president, he never was given that title. And so I was telling Betty Brady here that in Stetson's library uh, archives, they do not list Dr. Borders. Mm. Uh, but he was uh, here, a good friend of mine, dean of men again, and later on went on to work for the Florida Baptist Convention in their retirement annuity section, I think. Right. And then John Johns followed. And then John Johns, who was uh, again here, an inside candidate, had been business manager. Uh, he, his father, had been head of the Baptist Children's Home in Lakeland, so he had very strong Baptist convention credentials. And he utilized those and actually had a long tenure here in 1969 to 76. Mm -hmm where he went on to Furman and was a very successful president. I think the history of his time at Stetson is a, was a history of no salary increases, of uh, no uh, efforts to expand the student body. I think it was probably during this time that the Edmonds Center was built. Mm -hmm. and. I understood that they named it the Edmonds Center in order to try to attract donations, and I don't know, uh, donations for that building. That was, I think, the only building we were able to, to get in. Then you had faculty, because of tight finances, feeling very negative about the allocation to athletics in such a limited uh, budget situation. So the Johns period was not a particularly happy period. I remember uh, that Evans Johnson and Dr. Johns were very close, and Dr. Johns, uh, I think it was University of North Carolina, 
At any rate, he was a history major and a history of political science, and it was Dr. Johnson who just kept pushing him to get that dissertation finished, and he did finish it. And again, his tenure at Furman, historically, I think is viewed much more successfully than, than even at Stetson. It's sometimes hard when you're the interior candidate who moves up. He was new when he went to Furman. So. And he did, and, and I think there was all that to it, and a very skillful, uh, very skillful person in relations with the public and trustees, uh, but I don't think he was a strong fundraiser at, at Delenn. No, that came next. And, and so actually, Stetson continued to be very poor until Pope Duncan mm -hmm. came. Pope uh, is a very interesting person. He taught in the religious studies, uh, actually I keep saying religious studies, religion department at Stetson during those classic years of the Edmonds period. He became president of Georgia Southern, I believe it was. And the uh, competition to bring him in was somewhat severe, and he um, uh, finally came in, I think, among the most active persons promoting his hiring was uh, Dean Bob Chauvin, Robert Chauvin, uh, very important in Stetson's development. Uh, he was a faculty leader. Uh, we wanted an academician and someone who could deal with the Baptist issue because Pope, again being uh, very much in a, a theological background, uh, could do that. So Pope Duncan came in and he did start the, really start the fundraising mm -hmm. effort. He uh, was very successful. Uh, Stetson's endowment, which was very low, he presided during the uh, 1983 centennial, and around the, uh, the campus are trees that were planted by uh, uh, different persons, in honor of different persons. Uh, I think the fa president, faculty, senate, uh, but donors. Mm -hmm. uh, you look on the little plaques around. Uh, he was quite successful with that. He also brought in Doug Lee as a fundraiser, as I recall. And from, <coughs> and University of uh, uh, Richmond, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug was a young fundraiser, and and I guess probably the truth of the matter is that Doug had most of the. Uh, uh, most of the tools in the toolbox for doing the fundraising. But Pope was very successful. And again, not to brag, Pope was also very astute. Um, I mentioned to him that one of my friends was J. Hyatt Brown. Uh, now, I had a nine o'clock class Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, I was able to get a breakfast appointment uh, somewhere near what is now I, the I-95, uh, uh, I-4 area uh, on US uh, 92. I don't remember where it was, but we met with Hyatt Brown uh, for breakfast. I had to get back at nine now. Mm -hmm. So we met, I think, 7.30. And Pope was driving his Cadillac. I was in his Cadillac. And Pope and Hyatt hit it off. Oh, historic. You want to talk about, <laughs> you want to talk about history? Yeah. Uh, uh, wow. Hyatt, who is very uh, visionary, very visionary, I think saw something in Stetson and Pope. And Hyatt, as you know, became chairman of the board mm -hmm. of trustees. Right. Uh, as, a, as the university's grievance officer, I 
I sat with the board at one of the retreats. Um, they were going around. They needed uh, the hundred million, and uh, they were going around the trustees, seeing what they could do. And Hyatt says, uh, um, "CC and I'll take September." <laughs> really. <laughs> Yeah, it was very casual. Uh, uh, a million, uh, September, a million. We are running out of time. Isn't Dr. it Bailey. nice to run out of time? Getting there. One thing that we have neglected um, is to talk about your family. Your your family. Did you, were you married when you came here? Did you have children that you raised here? Thank you for allowing me to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, we. Uh, came here in 1963. My wife, Frances, was an elementary school teacher. She had a PhD pushing hubby through. <laughs> okay. Uh, that is, she worked during my time at the University of Florida teaching in a school in an adjoining county. Have four children. Patrick, my oldest son, was born the first year I was here, 1963. Then Sherry, a daughter, and then Kim, another daughter, and then Terry, or Terry Wayne Bailey Jr., actually, uh -huh. my youngest son. Mm -hmm. Sherry has now a law practice in Deland. Oh, how wonderful. Uh, Aiken Law. Mm -hmm. She's a double hatter, that is, Stetson law, that's an undergraduate, and the University of Florida, a degree, a master of tax. She interned with the Court of uh, uh, Tax in Washington, D.C. for two years as a, an intern, uh, and then to Columbus, Ohio, where she married her husband, 20 years in Columbus, Ohio, roughly, and then back to DeLand in back to DeLand. 2015. You're a fortunate man to have I'm her I'm a fortunate here. man, and my son Patrick, a long-distance truck driver, I uh, think he has driven over two million miles. Oh, my gosh. 25 years as a truck driver. He had worked for the county of Volusia also. My daughter, Kimberly, a practical nurse, retired uh, with disability, and Terry, a uh, really trained as a paramedic, in Salisbury, Indiana. So it's been good. Uh, I'm 85 years old, as you know. Uh, I'm fortunate to have had such uh, life experiences. Uh, again, when I came to Deland, I connected with William Amory Underhill, an iconic figure at Stetson. He uh, brought me into the classic that is the older 1950s, 40s, 50s, uh, Delan with his experiences and, and his acquaintances. All of those, all of those have passed, but I was really quite blessed to have such mentors. And now uh, I'm able hopefully to mentor some students as well. Well, you always have been known for your mentoring of students. And although this has dealt with Stetson mm -hmm. today, uh, I'm hoping working with uh, the West Volusia Historical Society, we can do something on my work with uh, the county government. Yes, which, I, uh, I am hoping that we can do a second interview because you have actually had more than one career. You've had a career with Stetson and you've had a back-behind-the-scenes career in politics, and that I'd like true. to talk it's with you about that, uh, too. So much so, and, so. and I guess the one thing I'm remembered by, uh, by all, many, is I'm largely responsible for Florida's Clean Indoor Air Act. Yes, that too. I worked on that as a member and officer in the American Lung Association for mm, nearly f around 40 years. Uh, and in fact, in 2004, was honored uh, by uh, the uh, National uh, 
organization uh, with uh, other health agencies uh, in Washington on national television. And for actually the one time in my life, I had a chauffeur and <laughs> a makeup artist and was introduced uh, to make uh, remarks on what was broadcast on the Discovery Channel. Uh, from little says, I had to have U.S. News and World Report here with a ph professional photographer taking the picture of T. Wayne Bailey. Okay. So there okay. are those things to talk about, and I hope we have an opportunity to have this. I've enjoyed it. Uh, if this is a, an archival record, I want you to know that the one thing I liked about Stetson was that it was a community. Mm -hmm. We had uh, a weekly counseling luncheon where faculty and staff gathered together from across the campus. We also had, uh, after chapel on Wednesdays, coffee in the faculty lounge. We all gathered together. And I mean, not everybody, but you'd have 15, 20 uh, of the faculty just talking to each other. I always felt freedom of the classroom, sovereignty of the classroom. Uh, I learned later in my career that the president and dean had sometimes had to defend me, but they never... <laughs> They never said anything to me about it. Mm, well, that's wonderful. I think Stetson was a community, and I know it strives in this time of cultural change and technological change. We don't talk to each other now, we email. I know that these are changes that no one could avoid, but I think we want to strive to do that. And my love for Stetson is real and present.